I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak today. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, work we've been doing on electromagnetic friction of a particle or an atom of both classical and quantum. And so we'll see how far we get. Let's we'll see. Well, now it doesn't want to. Maybe I didn't turn it on right. Oh, I think I. There we go. I turned it off. So uh, we've been working on this for three or four years. And this is a picture of my last two graduate students. Uh, Leon is now assistant professor in China. He's the one on the left from facing me. And Michael, the taller one, is my current PhD student. He should finish up in a year. So. Uh, so we have now four papers sort of in this series come out and more in the works. So let's start with classical friction. So everything's based on Maxwell's equations, if you like. We start with a charged particle. So here's sort of the generic picture we're thinking about. We're thinking entirely of a, a particle, maybe charged or neutral, moving perhaps moving always in the x direction with constant velocity and perhaps over some surface, which could be, in this case, a metal described by a Druda model. And so just classical electrodynamics. And so a, a formula that one can easily derive for the frictional force to so just the charge times the electric field that the particle feels is given in terms of the uh, xx component, x is the direction of motion, so it's the xx component of the reduced Green's function, evaluated at kx equals omega over v. And where the epsilons are frequency dependent, the dielectric constants, and there's a kappa of the z component, if you like, of the momentum. Z is the direction of, uh, we've chosen the coordinate system to emphasize this geometry. Z is the direction above the surface, and K prime, kappa prime is the corresponding propagation vector in the medium, so it has an epsilon in it. And the GXX, this reduced Green's function, is written in terms of the transverse electric and transverse magnetic Green's functions, which are given here in terms of the usual uh, reflection, transverse electric and transverse magnetic reflection coefficients. So it's all very simple. And as I said, we're going to use the Druda model to describe the metal. So we have two parameters, plasma frequency and this damping parameter nu. And for gold, which will be just purpose of illustrations, well, I'm using the nominal values of nine electron volts for the plasma frequency and 0 .35, 0 0.035 electron volts for the damping. And then I'm going to show you some figures. I won't go through the calculation. This paper came out a couple of years ago for the uh, frictional force, and it's dominated by the transverse magnetic. So I'm just showing the transverse magnetic uh, contribution on this log plot, log log plot. And so uh, the blue dots are actually the force we calculate. And you'll notice it goes along on roughly a straight line, not quite a straight line in the log log plot. And this is, uh, there's a asymptote for low velocities an asymptote for intermediate velocities, but then there's this big spike in the force toward in the ultra relativistic regime. And then it actually dips down, but it dips down to a finite value. So even with the damping, and the, the, this is showing, this is using the value of damping I just mentioned, 0 0.035 electron volts. Uh, if you reduce the damping by a factor of 10, then the frictional force becomes weaker in the intermediate velocity range, in the low velocity range, but it doesn't change the, speak, the spike for high velocities hardly at all. And as epsilon goes to zero, the, there's a finite limiting value for the friction. It was rather surprising. So this was previously studied non-relativistically, so we did the relativistic calculation. <clears throat> okay, first section, second section, Dipole, but start with the permanent dipole. So again, classical. 
So now we have the, the force density is just the charge density times the electric field, current density across the magnetic field. And where these current and charge densities are given by these expressions in terms of D, where I'm assuming the dipole moment has time dependence. So it has some definite time dependence. And it's moving along with constant velocity. So we always assume there's some external agency uh, keeping the particle moving uh, at this, this force to move at constant velocity. OK, so now we can just calculate the force, the electromagnetic force on the particle using the same notions we just wrote down, except now written in terms of dipoles. And so this is the formula. So it involves the square of the Fourier transform of the dipole moment at this Doppler shifted frequency. And this only involves, it's again, the, uh, this is for the X polarization, meaning the suppose the atom is, the particle is only polarizable in the same direction, or it's not polarizable, it has its dipole moment pointing in the same direction as the motion. Then this is the force for the X orientation of the dipole. Uh, and there's an I here, and that's saying you have to take the imaginary part. And the imaginary part comes from this one over kappa. It's the imaginary part of the Green's function. And that imaginary part occurs when omega is bigger than k. Omega squared is bigger than k squared. Then this propagation constant, this real propagation constant, turns into an imaginary quantity. And the, the reason it's minus I is because I'm dealing with retarded Green's function. So then you can integrate, you can take that previous formula, previous formula that involved an integral on, on kx. You can integrate out ky, because nothing depends on ky there, except kappa, integrate out ky. And then you're left with a formula which only involves the frequency. And that looks very reminiscent to something you know from elementary electrodynamics. The force, the average force, is proportional to the frequency integral of the Fourier transform of the dipole moment in the rest frame, that prime in there. So that's a notation I'll use throughout. The prime means quantity is evaluated in the rest frame of the particle. And there's a relation between the previous formula, I wrote down the dipole moment in the moving frame, but the, the dipole moment in the rest frame in the Fourier space is related to that in the uh, moving frame by these formulas. So you now then immediately recognize is this thing looks just like the formula for the power radiated, the total power radiated in the rest frame of the dipole is this, if you had a time dependent dipole, it involves the square of the Fourier transform of the dipole moment. And so that what this is saying is that the frictional force times time is equal to minus V gamma ER prime, which of course is true, because that means There's actually in the in the rest frame of the particle, there's no force on it because the particle's not moving. But the particle, because it has time dependence, the dipole is radiating, and so it's losing mass. So therefore, its momentum is changing. So in the moving frame, the momentum is changing, and therefore there's a radiation reaction force. So again, this is generalization of earlier work, which was done non-relativistically. But this is all relativistic. Okay. So finally, quantum. So we proceed sort of in the same vein, except now we're saying, okay, the dipole, there's no expectation value of the dipole moment but there's an expectation value of the square of the dipole moment. And so we use the fluctuation dissipation theorem to describe that. We say, oops, I went too far. We say uh, the DD correlation function, this is in the rest frame, that's what the primes mean, is given by the imaginary part of alpha. And then there's a cotangent factor, the thermal factor. And this is the beta prime is the temperature of the dipole in its rest frame. Likewise, there's field fluctuations, and they correspond to a different temperature. This is the temperature of the thermal radiation in its background, and the corresponding 
a susceptibility, if you like, is the imaginary part of the Green's function. So it's just a familiar fluctuation dissipation theorem, except they're written, this is written in the rest frame of the particle, and this is written in the rest frame, if you like, of the thermal radiation. <clears throat> and so the, the key point here is I'm assuming both these systems are in thermal states. The dipoles have a thermal distribution and the electromagnetic field has a thermal distribution, but at different temperatures. Okay, so it's a simple calculation now. It's again, just using the uh, Lorentz force law to calculate the force. So you can calculate the force in terms of these two different temperatures. So this is the, the particle part, which has temperature one over beta prime. And this is the field part, which has temperature one over beta. And there's this extra factor here, which reflects that Doppler shift bet uh, between these two frames. And uh, this is the form. So this Y is just a, a rescaled integration over, over KX, if you like, we had in the previous formulas. And we'll use this notation a bit. So you need to remember that y plus and minus, these limits on the y integration are gamma times one plus or minus v. And this force, as you look at it, if you stare at it a minute, it could be positive or it could be negative. So it might not be a frictional drag, it might actually be a push, depending on what the temperatures are. Um, okay, so this, this agrees with no, well-known formulas. If we assume beta is beta prime and we go to small velocities, this is an immediate generalization of the einstein hopf formula. So known 114 years ago or so. Uh, okay, so let's see. Non-equilibrium, steady state. Okay, so the first approach you can take uh, is to say, let's suppose the dipole is just an inert object has no intrinsic uh, imaginary part. The only fluctuations that it encounters is because it's coupled to the electromagnetic field and the electromagnetic field has fluctuations. And that will guarantee that the particle uh, conserves energy, doesn't absorb net energy. So we calculate the power just from the usual electromagnetic formula. Uh, the force is given by the usual Lorentz force law. But now we say that the correlations are entirely because of field fluctuations. So what you do now, you take the formula for the force or the power, whichever one you're interested in, and you assume the intrinsic, as I just said, and I'm assuming here that the intrinsic polarizability of the particle is, is real. There's no imaginary part there, but the dipole is induced by the electric field through the polarizability. And we expand out to second order these expressions for the energy, for the power, and for the force to second order in alpha using E equals gamma J, which is this, the, uh, the uh, relation between the propagation function and the electric current and the electric field. And then you use the fluctuation dissipation theorem on the electric field. Oops. And we're, uh, we've done the calculation in both frames. You can to check that everything is right. We calculated everything in both the rest frame of the particle and the rest frame of the radiation. And these things are related to each other because the power you can show just from a Lorentz transformation that the power in the rest frame of the radiation is the power in the, in the particle rest frame plus a V times the force in the particle rest frame. And likewise, the force in the rest frame of the thermal radiation is the force in the rest frame and V time plus V times the power in the rest frame. And this nest condition that I, that's automatically enforced when I say the fluctuations only come from the electromagnetic field is just then the statement that P prime is actually zero which means from these equations that F prime is F, the force is the same in both frames, and that P equals FV, that is to say, the power in the moving frame, frame in which the particle's moving, is exactly that required by the force times velocity. 
So now you can calculate the force, for example. So as I said, I went out to a second order in alpha. So here's the formula we get. Alpha, imagine part of gamma prime, alpha, imagine part of G. What's G? Well, G is, G is uh, we've just simply imagine part of gamma. Uh, this has been Fourier transform. We've transformed the KY away. We still have this integral on KX. So this, this guy, this is evaluated at equal times, equal, not equal times, equal spatial points. So this is equal to, easily see, since it's vacuum, this is special for vacuum, omega cube times unit. So therefore the force, frictional force, in general, I mean, this is actually more general. This is uh, more general than just the vacuum, but now when we assume the vacuum situation, uh, this is the formula for arbitrary polarizations. Oops. There we are. So alpha xx squared means the square of the, al the alpha squared, the matrix squared xx component. So alpha xx squared means alpha xx quantity squared, alpha xy, alpha yx, alpha xz, alpha zx, et cetera. So this is a general formula for arbitrary polarizations for the force involving an integral over frequency and an integral over these rescaled uh, momenta in the direction of motion. And there's the thermal factor here, okay? And of course, uh, the zero point energy doesn't contribute in this, so it's only, it only involves this factor. So this clearly goes to zero as the temperature goes to zero. There's no zero temperature frictional force. And there's these two structure functions that occur in here. This is for the X polarization and this is for the Y and Z polarizations. And that's formula. And you'll notice if you did the isotropic case, so that you said it's alpha XX equals alpha YY equals alpha ZZ, then you would take FX plus twice this. And so this complicated part in here, slightly complicated part, would cancel out. And you just be left with something that goes like one over gamma V. Oh, yes. Um, now you can also assume, excuse this, or was yes? But now there's another way of attacking this thing. You could imagine that you have independent dipole fluctuations, independent from the field fluctuations. That was our original, the original formula, our formula I wrote down when I first started talking about the quantum friction had both independent fluctuations going on. But, but then impose, impose the uh, nest condition, the condition that the energy of the particle doesn't change. Then you have a relation, you're requiring P prime equals zero or P equal FV. Then you get a relation between beta prime and beta, which is given by this. And so for an isotropic atom, it's given by a little bit more explicit formula because you can then do these, you can do the integrals in general, but they're complicated looking things. This is a simple looking thing, relatively so. Oops. So the most, uh, so let me, on this slide, I'll talk about a particular model, which is simple, and it's actually relevant because it uh, gives uh, limits that are uh, consistent with more realistic models, where you just have monomial dependence. The imaginary part of alpha goes like, say, omega cube. And this is actually the model you'd say if, if you had just radiation reactions. So this is actually fairly realistic. If you had an atom, if there were no radiation field around, the atom wouldn't radiate, wouldn't, it would have no imaginary part. Dissipation is entirely due to radiation. And so we could assume that. And then you could calculate explicitly what this temperature ratio. So I said here, there's some implicit formula between beta prime and beta. This tells us what temperature of the atom is given the temperature of the environment. Well, this formula now can be made explicit, for example, for this case, or in fact, for any monomial. So T prime over T is given by this explicit function, depending on the power of the monomial. Now you realistically say, well, N can only be an odd integer because 
imagine right off it has to be an odd number, but the formulas don't care. So this makes sense. And this is, again, this is a known formula. And here shows a graph. Uh, and you'll notice, uh, so there's a separatrix between uh, increasing functions. So this is t prime over t. So the atom uh, for all these cases up here, t prime over t is, is greater than one as you increase in velocity. Of course, at zero velocity, they all go to one. The ratio goes to one. Then it increases and it can be up, you know, factor of two easily. If you can get the high enough velocities. Uh, the separatrix occurs for n equals minus three, and then for n smaller than minus three goes negative, and it should not exceed the uh, uh, Einstein Planck temperature, which is one over gamma. It's done in this this uh, dark curve, which is exactly coincident with the n equal minus six curve. N equal minus seven, therefore, is excluded. Now, of course, whether that makes sense is something else again. Okay. So, uh, the nest, under the nest conditions, then th this is the formula we would have for when you impose the nest condition, add the DD and EE fluctuations, you can eliminate by virtue of that equation, you can explicitly eliminate any reference to the temperature of the atom, only depends on the temperature and environment. So the nest condition allows you to write this formula down, and this coincides exactly with the formula we had before, for only E fluctuations, provided I choose a suitable parameterization. Okay, because imagine part of alpha for any polarization has to be an odd function. And so I can always define it as omega cube over six pi, say, times an even function, which I cut my local alpha p squared. All right, so, and this is actually, you can think of this as the imaginary part of an effective polarizability and you expand this out to first order. There's a business of the renormalization, but I won't talk about that. Okay. So this shows the force uh, as a function of velocity for the radiation reaction model. And there, these are the, the forces. You, and you can see the numbers are very, very small. Okay. Uh, these are now in, in uh, Newtons. The numbers are small, 10 to the minus 38. Unless you can, of course, they get very large, so you'd have to get really close to the speed of light to start seeing us anything you could hope to measure. Or you could have to go to very high temperatures. So this shows for different velocities what the force is at 300K, room temperature, pretty small, 3000K, a lot bigger, 30,000K, quite big. Okay, and here I'm using. I'm using, I'm going a gold nanosphere. I'm using a Duda model. Okay. So in the previous, I was looking at the monomial model, but this is for gold nanosphere with damping here. And omega one is this plasma frequency divided by square root of three. Okay. And you'll notice the interesting thing is uh, definitely a strong increase with temperature. And they some, seem to be mostly going up, but this top one clearly bends over. Uh, the other ones do too, but you can't see it from this graph. This shows how, this is for different velocities, how the uh, force changes. You notice that some, there's a break here. You're going along basically with the N equal one model for low temperatures, which includes room temperature. But then somewhere around 10 to the fourth, fifth K, you have this inflection, and then it goes to an N equal minus three model for higher uh, temperatures. And let's see, the next picture, oops. Yeah, shows that it's always decreasing eventually. This was, we saw this for 30,000 K we saw on the previous slide, and it turned over, so this is showing it a different way. Uh, showing as a function of gamma, frictional force is a function of gamma, and it turns over, whereas at 300K, it also turns over, but you have to go to much higher gamma to see it. It turns over, and the maximum is here, of somewhere around 100 gamma, instead of gamma equal 100, instead of somewhere around gamma equal four. 
So you, it always turns over, and you can show, in fact, it falls off like one over gamma, three minutes, one minute, five, okay. All right, so it decreases, interesting. All right, let's see. You can also do, then you can add bells and whistles. You can say, well, really and truly, these parameters we put in here, if we're talking about temperature dependence, they ought to depend on temperature. In particular, we know uh, maybe the plasma frequency doesn't depend very strongly on temperature, but the damping sure does. And a simple model for that is this old block Grunison model. This thing starts off for low temperatures like T to the fifth, high temperatures it goes like it's linear in T. So if you put that in the formula, you have to do numerical calculations. And you can see these are the graphs of, the, this, is, this is actually the temperature ratio we're seeing here. Notice temperature ratio can get big, like five or six, uh, depending on the temperatures. And you can see putting in the temperature dependence of this does make some difference. Not a huge difference, but it certainly does. This is more, whoops, I got that. Uh, whoop, whoop, whoop. Went too far. All right, this is what I want. Uh, so here's a plot showing, you can see these different characters, uh, half the speed of light. And so this shows the temperature ratio. And you see the temperature ratio starts off at low temperature at this value, a little below 1.2, then it goes up. There's this, that's because of the resonance. This is for the gold manosphere again. And then it drops down and it eventually asymptotes at one. But if you put in this block Linerson model, then you see it lowers this little peak here, and then it asymptotes at a slightly larger value. So let's see. Uh, and this is also showing how the damping, the temperature depends on damping can influence things. So it changes, this is, the previous was the temperature ratio. Here we're actually seeing uh, the forces and you can see they're changed in sort of non uh, very obvious ways, right? Some cases the temperature dependence increases the force, in some cases it, it increases in different regions. In fact, at the highest temperature it didn't seem to do very much. But you can see here, so this is for uh, as a function of temperature, and you can see how it changes. This is for half the speed of light. And the blue curve was no temperature dependence of the damping. And the red dots are what happened in actuality if you keep the block Renison model, and you can see it changes that structure quite a bit. So that's interesting. Okay, let me see. I can just about finish this up. Out of Ness, what happens out of Ness? Well, now the total force, okay, I said, I may have said, obviously to keep the particle moving with constant velocity, I have to apply a external force because otherwise it's losing energy you got to keep it going you have to apply an external force and the total force then in the nest condition would have to be zero but if the particle gains energy then it doesn't have to be zero the external force plus the frictional electromagnetic force won't add up to zero but in fact it'll be equal to the power the rate at which the power is being absorbed or radiated by the atom times the velocity. That's just the mass change times the velocity. Uh, this means the mass change, the bare mass changes in the rest frame. And that's, uh, this is just saying because the total force, because the particle is gaining and or losing energy, there necessarily is a total net force on it because its inertial properties are changing. And that suggests that this nest condition is stable. In other words, if you're not in nest, you will try to return to nest. So if the temperature is less than the nest temperature, if the temperature of the atom is too cold, the particle will actually heat up because it will be gaining energy. Whereas if the temperature is too high, the particle will be losing energy, it'll cool off. So we believe this is indication of stability, although we don't have a complete proof of that. Uh, so let me just end up here by saying a couple words about observability, okay? So the obvious way to observe quantum friction would be just to somehow have this particle traveling along for a long time and it's losing energy. And so it will slow down if you don't keep it, keep it, keep it driven. 
So if you take the non-relativistic formula, low temperature result goes like this. So that involves a temperature to the eighth power times the velocity. And that's going to be equal to the rate of change of the momentum. So you can calculate how long it takes uh, to go from a velocity V sub i to V sub f. Goes like that. So if you put in numbers for gold atom, it's 10 to the minus 25 seconds. So this is going to be a long, long time. So that means if you have a really good graduate student, you keep them around for six years, working away in the lab, and you could somehow do this at 30,000 Kelvin, you'd see, you could see a 10% reduction in the velocity. So this doesn't seem like super practical, but could be done. Maybe you can think of some ingenious way to enhance it. So of course, you go to uh, higher temperatures or uh, this is already high. This is still actually low by the sense of what we mean by low in terms of those curves where you saw the, the bend over from one regime to the other. This is still low for a gold atom. But we think the better way to proceed is to try to see if you can measure this temperature ratio because it's not small. This is small, but this isn't. Because, for example, this is the formula that we have. This is the formula that's in Fullerton and Pearson. And we, we derive T prime over T at, at half the speed of light is 20, it's 25% increased. Okay, that should be observable spectroscopically. You just have to get this atom going. This is, uh, would seem like a viable way to look for quantum friction in the vacuum. Okay, and I think that's where I'll stop because I've run out of time. So we've, we've got all sorts of new things that we're starting to explore, but maybe I'll just stop here. Uh, uh, two questions. In, in one of the slides, slide 17, that you talk about uh, renormalized polarizability. I, I'm not Oops. sure what was the meaning. Ah, renormalized. Uh, that you said that you have an effect, no, sorry, an effective polarizability after you do some renormalization, but I, I. Well, okay, the point is there. I think it was, no, the other way, 17. I think it was like oh, 17. Oh, I'm, like, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry, I was going ahead. I'm looking hard to see at the screen. There. There we were, yes. Right. Well, the point is, if you imagine, you know, carrying out this series, you're saying alpha, remember alpha, we said with alpha, alpha, gamma, alpha, alpha, gamma, alpha, gamma, alpha, and so on. You do an expansion like that in powers of alpha. And... So you sum, it, sum up that series, you get one over, uh, you get alpha naught, say, times one plus, one plus alpha or gamma alpha, and so on. Okay, one over, one over gamma alpha is what I mean. But there's a real part which is divergent. So the renormalization is absorbing the real part, which makes sense, it only makes sense for the vacuum calculation but you can absorb the real part into the definition of alpha. So the alpha gets renormalized in that sense. Okay. So it absorbs the real part of the propagator, and then the imaginary part is here, and that's the omega cube. We saw that in one of the slides. And, and maybe so that's a, the renormalization. Again. Okay. And maybe a naive question. When you talk about the relativistic behavior, so, so you have the sphere with a dielectric function, and you study the relativistic behavior but what's the meaning of a dielectric function in relativity, like a, a ah, relativistic yeah, not, not, No, no, no. But the point is we're always referring to the part. We always work in their own respective rest frame. So the atom, we only describe the atom in its rest frame. So the polarizability is always defined in the rest frame of the particles, not in the rest frame. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Because these things transform in non-trivial ways in different frames. So the alpha that I've written down here and everywhere is the rest frame Particle rest frame alpha. So we only define that. The temperature is only defined in the rest frame of the respective objects, the, the, either the environment or the particle. The alpha is only defined in the rest frame of the particle. OK, thank you. Hi, Kim. Just uh, so the 
temperature is your the effect is observable only at very high temperatures what? but then you know the effect is observable right now only at very high temperatures right that's the conclusion that's the conclusion yeah. that to, to get it feasible you have to go to high temperatures yeah. but the question is i mean then the integrity of the atom is not there right well, that, of course, is the problem. Of course, we realize yeah. that 30,000 Kelvin, you're yeah. not going to be able to keep an atom. Yeah, not, not of course. even. Of course. So that's why thousand. we're saying, so, so of course, the whole picture is, is ridiculous. We can't go to 30,000 Kelvin. So that's why we think the signature for this should be to look at uh, spectroscopically somehow the temperature ratio, because that's going to be observable at modest velocities at room temperature. Because that temperature ratio didn't depend on the velocity. Okay. I mean, it, yeah, it does depend on the velocity, but it's. So my question is, I see the um, polarizability of the atom, but where is the surface? What are the properties of the surface in this problem? In, in, in oh, the treatment well, that you know, here we didn't, because this is a vacuum, except for the little bit I mentioned at the very beginning where we had a charged particle passing above the surface. So what I was going to continue with, if I'd had another half hour, was the, of course, you want to generalize to having a surface. Okay, and, and we are, Where of course, we know how to do that if, if we're very close to the surface. What we're trying to do is a more general situation at finite temperature, because most of the work actually on, on quantum friction or quantum vacuum Casimir friction is zero temperature. We want to work at finite temperature. But if you have friction, maybe my understanding is, is wrong. So I have something that's moving against something else. But here no, but it, you have particle. friction in the vacuum. Okay. The point is this is saying okay, you have so a neutral particle okay, okay, okay. moving through the vacuum. It experiences okay, friction so it's because, coming from the vacuum. because it's, it's feeling a wind, if you like, from okay. it's moving through the... All right, yes, now I understand. Sorry. And it, it, the energy balance is because it radiates. So, but it has to be at finite temperature. No, 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 it's because it's intrinsic property. It's radiating because it's got time dependence. Just like in the classical picture, a time dependent dipole radiates. These quantum fluctuations are time dependent. So there's radiation associated with those. So the, the atom is moving along. It's constantly being buffeted by the, the black body radiation it's moving through, but its energy is being conserved because it radiates just enough energy but the radiation it emits in its rest frame is isotropic. Whereas in its rest frame, it sees a direction. So there's a direction that's the frictional force. It pushes it, the electromagnetic frictional force pushes it backward. And so if you didn't have some external force to keep it going, it would slow down. Yes. Well, yes, because it's all because of the electromagnetic field fluctuations. Right. Right. So it's the FDT. Yeah. And then I have a confirmation for your you know, uh, theory. It's lamp shift. Well, sure. Lamp, yeah, of course. But <laughs> yeah, we know the lamp shift. Yeah, we know all that's true. Right. But I'm just saying one could directly observe. I believe in directly observing things rather than just saying, well, it must be true because... Yeah. So I would like to be able to go out and do a measurement of this quantum frictional force, and I'm saying the way to do it is to look for the temperature of the atom. And I should think with modern techniques that would be relatively easy. I mean, you'd want the particle to be moving at a substantial fraction of the speed of light if you could do it. But you could... Even at lower frequency, at lower velocities, I mean, I would imagine with modern techniques you could you can measure small temperature changes. Yeah. So my question is probably pretty simple, but uh, for example, in fluid dynamics, you can have uh, you know viscous forces, but then you can also have I'm not sure what the exact term they call, but maybe like viscous torque. Uh, so, so have you considered uh, generalizations of this for like a rotating? Uh, ah, yes, yeah, so that's interesting. No, we haven't really looked at oh, what would happen. Yeah, of course, and, and, and people have done this, right? So, yes, you can imagine a, a, a body that's a spherical nanosphere or something rotating, and there would be a, a torque. Well, we, haven't, we haven't worked on that, no. 
we've just been thinking about a, you know, either an atom or a, a, a nanosphere. We've, we basically, though, have allowed for uh, anisotropy. Okay, um, thank you for the talk, Kim. I, I'm, I, I think I missed the, some part of the talk. How, how you, uh, you, when you talk about the uh, given temperature is in the uh, lab frame, right? The frame where the atom or the particle is moving, right? And, well, and you compute, okay. There's two temperatures, right? There's the temperature of the atom, that's measured in the atom's rest frame. Okay. And there's the temperature of the environment, the black body temperature, that's in the rest frame of the black body radiation. Okay. So all temperatures are defined I, we don't want to get into this murky subject of how temperatures transform. There's a hundred thousand yeah. different answers. They're not, it's just not a well-defined thing. So the temperatures are always with respect to the rest frame. So, but the, the calculation frame. is in the lab? The, we this do is the a, calculation both ways and get the same answer, of course. Okay. Yeah, we calculate the force and the power in the rest frame of the atom and in the rest frame of the radiation, get the same answer. Well, the powers are different in the two, but we, they correspond to the formulas that we wrote down. More questions? Well, if not, we thank Kim again.